Robert Heath, Wireless Communications Lab, lecture number 28, final lecture. Uh, first announcement is targeted for graduate students. You know who you are. Please not forget to turn in your project. The upload is in Blackboard, so you have to upload your electronic version. Um, and then if there's any supplemental information you need to send me, then you should send it to me via email. But be sure that your electronic version is there. And, uh, Pardon me, could you uh, check the mute switch? Oh, mute switch. Yes. All right, you got it now? Thank you. All right. Okay, so... Yeah, announcements here. Graduate students, do not forget to turn in your project. Upload is through Blackboard. And then our final exam is Monday, December 16th, a week from... Uh, next Monday. And then the uh, exam, the, the other homeworks that haven't been graded yet should be handed back uh, next Monday. I just realized they actually hadn't been handed back yet, so uh, they should be handed back with the solutions on Monday there. Uh, the exam itself is essentially, think about it like two midterms, roughly the same length. So I'm targeting it for um, 150 minutes and you have 180 minutes to take it. So you have a whole extra uh, 30 minutes in that exam there, um, which I suppose many of you will use to keep doing the exam. Um, but that's fine. Feel free to leave after 150 minutes. And then for this exam, you may have three pages of handwritten notes, front and back. So presumably, you use your two previous ones and add another one. You can, of course, have a different one if you like. Any questions about exam, procedures for the exam? I think I have the location of the exam uh, on Blackboard as well. It's not going to be in here. It's going to be somewhere else. Questions about the exam? Nope. Okay. Well, uh, what we're going to do right now is I'm going to go through the, the syllabus a bit, and then I received uh, one whole email with some questions in it. So I will go through those questions, and then I will, if we have time remaining, address other questions that you may have here. So, you know, the first thing to do is just to talk about the, I want to go through the lecture outline, you know, just talk briefly about some of these topics, and then if you have questions on these, I can go back in, in more detail here. So first of all, let's zoom, zoom this in a little bit here. Yes. All right, so where we started, you know, in the class was there was an introduction to the wireless lab, and that, that was really, that lecture was really motivation for wireless communications, and we talked about some of the different standards, many which we didn't do in the class, you know, 3G, 4G, 2G, 1G, talked about wireless LAN, personal area networks, um, and about where things are headed here, you know, so that's really just an informative lecture, um, you know, I encourage you to, to review it, but I don't know that I can extract anything in there for the final, but that material is useful for you to know. You know then we transitioned into, you know, first of all, a, a high-level overview of digital communication. And the, the main thing here is the description of the, uh, the complete block diagram for a digital communication system, including some of the functions that we didn't deal with normally in class here. This is where we saw um, functions like uh, encryption, decryption, forward error correction, and error control decoding, and then source and the channel. So it is useful for you to go through that material again and think about how you could, given you know what we've learned in subsequent lectures, how you could combine that with a more sophisticated block diagram that incorporates modulation, demodulation, and synchronization, all of that. So that's... Um, what I would suggest here for the digital communication overview. And also when you go back through that now, it'll make a lot more sense because some of the concepts like the waveforms, the pulse shaping, the symbol mapping were maybe not clear when we talked about it in chapter two, but hopefully they're clear now. So after that, uh, you know, we transitioned to some background here, signals and stochastic processes. 
This was meant to be a, you know, primer on primarily white sun stationary random processes because that's what we need for the class. And I realize that sometimes it's included in, in 351K, sometimes it's not. Um, the material here, you know, in this chapter here, that's important. I mean, you've, you've essentially, the white, sun so the white sun stationary concept, you know, computing, mean, covariance, correlation function, determining if a process is white sense stationary or not. I mean, that's, that's like the main things I, I recall from that section there. We did talk a little bit about ergodicity. Now, I didn't ask you to prove things about ergodicity, but you do need to know how you use the ergodic concept to estimate the mean, the covariance, the correlation. So I would expect you to be able to do that. Uh, so that's like on the, the signal stochastic process side. So then we spent, um, you know, one whole lecture here on uh, transforms and the sampling theorem. So here, you know, the, from the perspective of the final, the main thing is that, you know, we talked about the continuous time Fourier transform, the discrete time Fourier transform, and we reviewed the properties and uh, common notation. And so I would expect that you can use those properties and notation to take, you know, Fourier transforms as needed. Not an emphasis in the course, but you can imagine I can construct many problems that involve taking a Fourier transform along the way. So you should be comfortable with that. Uh, it, in particular here, we also talked about um, you know, two theorems that were important. One is just this Shannon-Nyquist theorem, the sampling theorem. You know, how, if you want to have perfect reconstruction, um, how high do you have to sample? And if the signal's band limited, then you can sample at exactly twice the rate or slightly more than that and perfectly represent that signal with the samples. And then this, the second theorem is important was the um, discrete time processing of continuous time signals. And this here was about, you know, coming up with a, a way to let me write out this here. This is essentially about, let's see how big this is here. Ah. You have a system going into some continuous time filter, but you suppose that your input signal is band limited, so we can replace that with a digital system. sampled at a particular rate. Which looks something like this here. Um, and then this, this uh, what we did in that section there is we derived the relationship between this impulse response, which is continuous time, and this impulse response, which is discrete time. And the connection was something like H of N is equal to T times a particular low-pass filter involved with our impulse response. Whole thing sampled at particular sample rate, T such that Nyquist is satisfied. And this, this uh, you know, particular theorem is important because it's what allowed us to um, think about everything, the channel in particular in discrete time. You know, we started off, you know, realizing that the whole world is in continuous time, but because we we're going to send band-limited signals or reasonably approximated band-limited signals, we could, we could then um, represent this in discrete time here. And so then we um, went to here in, chap in section 5, we talked about frequency response of random signals where we related the power spectrum to the um, autocorrelation function, Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. We defined just notions of bandwidth, and then we went into the complex envelope notation. And then in the next lecture, we talked about up conversion, down conversion, the complex baseband representation. 
and the complex baseband equivalent channel. So here, the up and down conversion, you know, this is just talking about how we create a passband signal from a baseband signal and how we take a passband signal. So how we go from passband to baseband, that's down conversion, and how we go from baseband to passband, that's up conversion. And so there was, um, a, you know, a couple tricks in there, essentially just with the, the filtering and um, multiplication. And then the perhaps trickiest part here was the complex baseband equivalent channel. And what we did here was we went from a continuous time mathematical representation of the impulse response to a specific equivalent discrete time impulse response that reflected how our passband signal gets distorted. You know, so, so the key picture here to remember is this one that looked like this here. Let's see. You know, we have this impulse response of our channel in the frequency domain. And then we had this whole story that the uh, signal is centered around some particular band because that's all we care about here. And so then we argue that, well, all we need to know is really the channel in the band there. And then we came up with a equivalent, you know, channel here, which essentially involved down converting this passband filtered channel, and there was a little factor of two that appeared somewhere in there here. This is like here. So essentially this, you know, observation one is all we care about is the passband filtered channel. Observation two is we can equivalently look at that at baseband. And then observation three is that we can use this up this up here to sample it. Now that you have um, looked a little bit at some of these, you know, channel properties, okay. So now that you've looked at some channel properties from the end of the lecture, you kind of, at the end of the, the series of lectures, you have a sense now about you know, this initial exercise in creating the discrete time equivalent system here, you know, was, was allowing us to go between continuous time and discrete time. And then we were going to use that observation to build up, you know, discrete time signal processing algorithms to process the signal, extract the information that's sent. Later what we did when we talked about channel modeling is we really talked about models for the, um, the sampled channel. You know, so after we went through all this work here, we, we kind of stopped, and after, say, this lecture, everything we did was in discrete time. When we talked about channel models, we were really talking about models for the impulse response of the channel in discrete time, H of n, not so much the continuous time impulse response. And then this was all deterministic. There's nothing random here, but we, at some point, said that, hey, that impulse response is a random variable. Let's compute the performance in that, and that was what we did later in the class here. But, but at this point, this is really just a, an exercise in deterministic signal processing using um, basic DSP concepts. As a uh, word of advice here, ask any questions that you might have. If you don't have any questions, that's fine. If you think of a good exam question, let me know, but don't ask it now. Just send me an email on it. That'll help me out tremendously. Otherwise, I just have to give, you know, the usual hard problems that I already have on the final, so. Uh, okay, so after that, you know, we, we shifted our focus from the system to the signals that we're sending into the system. And this is digital communication that we're doing. And so we said, okay, you know, we're going to look specifically at um, quadrature, pulse amplitude modulated signals. Why does this not like my 
Oh yeah. Yeah, so we're going to look at quadrature of pulse amplitude modulation here. So this was essentially where we said that, okay, you know, we're not going to consider just an arbitrary band-limited signal. Rather, we're going to consider one that is built up in a very specific way. Now, this signal looks a lot like a band-limited arbitrary band-limited signal, except that instead of a sync function, we have a pulse shaping function. Instead of nothing, we have a, some kind of scaling function here. So that was, you know, how we started our um, effort in digital communication. We talked about constellations, transmit energy, transmit bandwidth, additive white Gaussian noise channel. Other things to note here, you know, how, how we have defined the normalizations of these symbols here and the normalization of the pulse shapes and the fact that we have the square root of EX here. So those are things that are particular, you know, to the class, but, you know, I could, I could ask you to normalize a pulse shape, tell me if um, this, the constellation is zero mean, if it's unit energy. So those are things that are important here. Now, in the additive white Gaussian noise channel, um, so where we're adding adding noise. Now we we shifted from there to optimal pulse shapes here. The idea was that we said that okay, given this input output relationship here, if I have this, I have the additive white Gaussian noise channel, where I take that receive signal and I add to it some noise. then the receiver for that signal looks something like this here, where I take my Y of T, I filter it by a what we later found to be a mesh filter. We sample that at the um, symbol rate. And then we performed detection on the resulting output here. And so we spent a couple lectures, you know, we established that this should be a match filter. And also that it should satisfy the zero ISI re requirement. And then we derived the detector that maximizes the likelihood function assuming an input-output relationship, something like this here. Right, and so then we derived what that detector should do, and that detector turned out to do something like this here, argmin over s, y of n minus s squared, something like that. We showed that using the likelihood function, simplifying it down. That was here. That was maximum likelihood detection is here. And the, after deriving the detector, we derived a bound on the probability of symbol error, the, specifically the union bound. And so that was basically we derived the probability that some symbol S of n let's call it some symbol S, is decoded by mistake as symbol S prime, assuming there's only S and S prime in the constellation. And that, we started off with saying that, well, that's equal to EX over 2N naught times the minimum distance between S and S prime. And then we use that to bound the probability of error Something like m minus 1, q square root, ex over 2 and not d min squared here. And so this was the union bound on the probability of error here. So the, the steps here are important. We did not go through the derivation of why this was the q function here. I explained why it was, but I didn't give you a really formal derivation. But we, we did um, to talk a little bit more about, you know, this upper bound here. So why is there d min here? Why is this m minus 1? That's 
essentially counting up all the possible error events and then counting for the uniform probability that we assume for the constellation symbols, then we ended up with an M minus 1 there. And this is a way of evaluating the performance of a digital communication system that's operating in added to white Gaussian noise using um, a quadrature pulse amplitude modulated signal. After we, did, we made these derivations here, we spent a little bit of time, I, f I forgot to mention this here, on just implementing the pulse shapes. And so the, the objective here was to, was to write this more in a form that was all discrete time, followed by a digital, digital continuous converter, discrete to continuous converter. And then here, the objective was to, whoops, was to take this and sh essentially shift it over here so that we could do our filtering in discrete time. And so we established that using multi-rate identities. Now, yes, question. Do you want to know, do you want to know yeah. this? Yeah. yeah, this here. Yeah, so this was uh, essentially, You know, we actually didn't compute it here. So if you consider a two-dimensional plane here, it's like real and imaginary here, and I put two points on it. Let's call this S. Let's call this S prime here. Now, if I have additive um, white Gaussian noise, it turns out that, and I have only two points, that the optimum detection rule according to maximum likelihood and you can see this from the maximum likelihood detector as solving this problem here. So these, these points over here, it's going to be all the y such that y minus s is less than y minus s prime. Right? Because any point over here is closer to this s than it is s prime. Over here, any point is closer to s prime than s. And, and, you know, you can go through and evaluate this for each point, and hopefully you can see that, logically, the boundary between these two regions is going to be this line here that is perpendicular to the line between S and S prime, and it intersects exactly at this distance over 2. So this length here is S minus S prime. And then this right here is S minus S prime over 2. And then here's the, the, the small piece which we didn't do, but essentially if you compute the probability that this, so you compute something like this here, the probability that S is decoded as S prime, given that S was sent. And it's essentially the probability that this is that Y minus S prime is actually greater than Y minus S. And then, you know, conditioning on S and S prime, given that this is noise, effectively what that means is that, so let's see, S is here. So, if we add, you know, kind of a Gaussian distribution on top of this, it would look kind of like this here. Now, this is a little difficult because it's kind of a 2D Gaussian distribution here. And so we are essentially saying, what's the probability that, so what we did is we sent, so y, y is equal to S plus B, but it turns out that Y minus S prime is greater. So what this means is that Y S minus S prime plus V is greater than Y minus S, which is greater than V here. So it essentially means that this, you know, this noise is big in the sense that it's taking our observation and pushing it over here. And so that Q function, all it is is, the, is really just the integral of this tail 
of this Gaussian function here. The thing that we didn't do is I didn't really explain it to you in the 2D because it's there's a couple small things. If you take digital communications that you have to do, but it's just a matter of factors of two here and there. So there's a reason it's like d min squared over two and not d min squared over four. That's basically the thing I didn't do. So, but that's essentially the intuition here is that this, this perturbation of this signal is so perturbed that it goes over here and then we compute the, the likelihood that that happens and that's just the integral is just the Q function. So and the Q function being integral from x to infinity to the minus x squared over 2. And you know, there's various sundry normalizations that you'd have to play with here. All right. Okay, so at this point, um, you know, we covered the, the material that we've done up to like midterm one. Any questions about that? Any other questions? So here, you know, in my mind, we were just operating here in, you know, kind of digital communication fantasy land. You know, there was very simple channel or no channel. There was, um, you know, perfect synchronization and just the Gaussian noise. So after midterm number one, you know, we look behind the curtain here to see what is uh, really going on. And then we said that, okay, yeah, you know, we have to sample the right place. So that led us to a sample timing offset algorithm. We looked at maximum output energy criterion, and we looked at two approaches. Uh, if you remember, there was a discrete approach, and there was an approach that was kind of an, an analog slash discrete time. And, and I, I, I mean, I cover this because, actually, I just find this analog discrete thing really interesting because you can optimize a function and then kind of you know, take its derivatives and then sample the result and try to push it to zero. Or you can you know, kind of sample the objective function up front and then try to push it to its maximum or whatever. So it's sort of, it's just two different ways of solving the same problem. And that's the, the other main thing to get out of that. So aside from just the fact that you have to do timing, is that there are these different mathematical ways of justifying and, and building an algorithm for that. This is also important because, you know, it's, it's likely that all of the approaches we've done in this class are probably going to be too simple for if you ever want to really do this as a real engineer. And so you have to you know, be flexible and, and think about different alternatives. And so I bet this is just an area where there's, you know, different options. Not obvious which is better. Now, after that, we, we went to a step further. And we said, well, not only do we know where to s not know where to sample, we also don't know where the symbols begin. So how can we find the beginning of the symbols? And we, we talked about frame synchronization. And then we said that, yeah, well, at, at minimum, there's a delay between the transmitter and the receiver. And that is going to lead to an attenuation and a phase shift and a symbol timing offset and a frame timing offset. So given all of that, if we can solve the frame and symbol timing problems, we still have an unknown gain in phase. And so then we need to estimate that so that we can equalize it. And that was what we did here with channel estimation. So we talked about channel estimation, and then we took a... Um, a detour over here, very important detour, into linear least squares. So this is a mathematical tool that allows us to solve problems that are, are not well posed. And we used it to solve a problem, essentially finding an unknown given some known things. So the basic problem that we dealt with up here looked like, you know, send. I observe a vector, I send a vector, this vector is multiplied by an unknown channel, there's also some additive noise. And so we tried to estimate this H as saying that, hey, let's use our knowledge of the channel to solve a least squares problem, so let's find the H such that we minimize 
the difference between the vector y, this h here, let's call this h, let's call this h bar here, over all possible h bars, and then we found that going through this, in particular here, the least square solution was going to be t star y divided by t star t. So we, we wanted to, we wanted to use y, our observation. We know t, we want to find h here. And then this turns out to be a special case of the general least squares problem where I have something that looks like y equals hx, ax, and then I find that x least squares is equal to a star a inverse a star y. And we also derived the squared error for that. So aside from, you know, just least squares itself as being, you know, an important mathematical tool, the, the other concept here to take away is that, you know, it, it is a tool. We used it to solve several different problems. You also might find that least squares isn't good enough in practice. You might have to use mean squared error or some other technique. But you can then essentially use that other technique to solve a similar set of problems. You know, so, so don't get stuck up so much on the least square solution. You know, what you should get stuck on is the fact that, okay, I have a problem here. I have a known, I have a known, I have some unknowns, and I need to figure out how to, how to deal with that. So that's kind of the problem. This was the objective function, so we proposed that this was a good way to find h-bar, and then we found it. So we could put in here another way to find h-bar and get the estimate of the channel. That would be fine, too. So it's this, this, is, this is the problem. This is the solution. I think the problem is, in this case, they're both important because we did a lot with least squares. But you know, knowing the problem is, is more important long term. Now we use that uh, least squares tool to do channel estimation, both narrow band and broad band, so frequency selective channels. We also used it to derive an equalizer, and we used it um, actually to help us with, with uh, synchronization as well. So we used that several different places. The tricky part here with the linear least squares channel estimation was that we said, okay, I've now got a, an observed sequence that's the convolution between something I don't know and something I know plus noise. And to make that tractable, we reformulated that in a vector form, which you could write as, say, something like this here. Maybe we use different notation there. And we found that the solution was just the least square solution we had before. But you had to pay, pay special attention to how you built up this S matrix because um, we had to only include the information that we knew. So if we write out S, and I imagine that my H is H0 through H of L, then I have to put here like this S. So suppose I'm sending my training here. This might be T of L, T of L minus 1, dot, 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 through T of 0, all the way down through T of N. Something like this here. So the, the important part of this exercise was realizing that we can only use the values of the training that we know. And so this matrix contains the training from 0 to nt minus 1, but its overall dimension is going to be like something like nt minus l minus 1 by l plus 1, I think. So that was the, the important point in this, um, this tricky part here. This is 13 here. And then we, um, we argued that equalization using a filter was maybe not the best approach. 
And so then we introduced this um, notion of frequency domain equalization. And to do that, we leveraged the discrete Fourier transform, which gives us a basis representation for finite length signals. The, the key thing about the DFT, so there were two important differences between the DFT and the other transforms. Right? The first one was the, the, the time shift property. So essentially, you know, if I have a signal here, let's call it T, it's a function of N. If I shift it by K, first of all, it's finite length, so shifting it by K doesn't quite make sense. It turns out that shifting by K modulo N was what corresponded to something like e to the minus j 2 pi I screw something up here sorry it's k m I think that's right there so the main point here was that you had to do this modulo to get this time shift property to work. And then the second one was about the circular convolution. So the duality here, you know, convolution in time is a product in frequency. What we actually had was that circular convolution in time. So it looks something like this here. So you go from, this looks like convolution normally, except I put a modulo here, and I have T and Q. I have N and M here, so I put K over here. So I don't get hung up on the K, the M, the Q, whatever. Just, just an example. So these are the two important facts about the DFT. And then what we wanted to do is we wanted to use it for frequency domain equalization, but the problem is we have this circular convolution. And that led to this um, idea that if we have a large block of data and a little bitty channel, if we add a copy of this data here, over here, in the form of a cyclic prefix, as long as it's long enough, part of the output, so let's suppose this is, this is H, this is W, part of the output between the convolution of the channel and the input data, it's equal to, you know, stuff for some N and circular convolution for some other N. something like this here. This is very technical, I know, with stuff here, but um, this was just partial convolution here and circular convolution here. So that led to the idea of the cyclic prefix. And then the cyclic prefix um, allowed us to obtain a circular convolution, which then lets us do equalization in the frequency domain. So the, the circular, the cyclic prefix is what powers OFDM and single carrier frequency domain equalization. Without that cyclic prefix, well, you'd have to do something else tricky to make, to do something similar here. And one of the examples is a zero padding. And you can, if, if you treat it in the right way, if you use zero padding, you can make the whole system act like there's a cyclic prefix. And I, I think we did that on the homework. Did we do that on the homework? Or did I give it to you on the exam? Or maybe it's on the final. I don't remember. But somewhere. So, oh, yeah, no, I think I came up with a new one for the midterm. Yeah. All right. So that's, um, okay, so frequency domain, 
We're going to operate on finite blocks of data. We need a circular convolution, so we use the Sigler prefix to get circular convolution. And then we found that we could equalize in the frequency domain either by taking the DFT, inverting the channel, taking the inverse DFT, or by the transmitter doing an inverse DFT, hitting the channel, then taking the DFT at the receiver doing equalization. And that's basically everything at the receiver is single carrier frequency domain equalization, half and half is OFDM. And that brings us up to lecture number 14, which is essentially halfway through the material covered here. Now, we, we made some comparisons between single carrier frequency domain equalization and OFDM. Uh, they, they both need overhead for the cyclic prefix. The OFDM signal tends to look more wriggly. It's um, because you're taking the FFT of a bunch of symbols, so it has uh, higher peak to average power ratio. It's, it's not such a smooth signal. That's its kind of main um, drawback. But OFDM has some other advantages. It, it, um, I mean, first of all, there's just the symmetry. You know, it's nice to have sort of the, the DF, IDFT at one end, the FFT at the other. It has this kind of concept that we're communicating information in the subcarriers. You can do optimization of the information on the different subcarriers. Uh, you can actually allocate users to different subcarriers. It, it's, you know, there's a reason it's been used for many commercial systems. Okay, so after doing that, we, w we dealt with our final main impairment, which is frequency offset. And with frequency offset, the problem is that we have a received signal, assuming we've done the sampling correctly, that looks like y of n equals e to the j 2 pi epsilon n sum over l. So we have the, um, this new term, which was the residual carrier frequency offset. So that epsilon here corresponding to the difference between the transmit frequency, the received frequency, times this symbol period. And the goal of carrier frequency offset synchronization was essentially to estimate the epsilon here. Because if you know the epsilon, you can just hit y of n with e to the minus j 2 pi epsilon hat of n and continue on. You're basically done. So really the action was in estimating the carrier frequency offset. But to do that, we did um, this one particular algorithm called the Moose algorithm where we use a repetition of a signal twice to drive that offset. Now that repetition, the idea was to say, okay, so I'm going to send some data. I'm going to send some more data like this in time, which you can't see. Then I have initially And then if I go over here, n samples away, and actually you really have to start with um, you have to start like here at L because of the memory and the convolution here. And so then here you start over here at n plus L. We get. You got G, e to J 2 pi epsilon n, E to J 2 pi epsilon capital N, sum from L equals 0 to L, H of L, S of, now this was like our training here, so let's call this T, and then we have T of 
n plus capital N minus L plus this noise here for n equals L to n minus 1. And then we said, well, this is just equal to T of n minus L. And then, in fact, this whole thing here is just approximately e to the j 2 pi epsilon n y of n over the range n from L to n minus 1 here. And, and we're, we need that because we have to avoid these edge effects with our convolutions. So our convolution comes in, there's a little edge effect here, comes over here, there's a little edge effect here. So then here we built a, uh, we had a Homer problem where we derived the maximum likelihood estimator, which we found was essentially equivalent to doing the least squares solution, where we solved the relaxed least squares problem and then found the phase of that solution. So that was the, the cool thing there. It turns out that if you had three repetitions, this is not the least, this is not the maximum likelihood solution. So I was like assigning that homework problem. I was thinking of the general repetition case when I assigned it, and then later I realized that, yeah, actually it also simplifies down to what we did, which is, which is actually is good. Um, but things get a little more tricky if you have three repetitions. So just to, as a thought experiment here, consider what would happen if you had a repetition over here, right? Suppose we had a third one. Well, you'd have a repetition that you could exploit between this one and this one, and you'd have a repetition you could exploit between this one and this one. But you'd also have a repetition you could exploit between this piece and that piece. So there's actually three here, but they're not all independent because the data is shared in the different repetitions. And so when you'd go through and derive the, optim the optimum maximum likelihood uh, frequency offset estimator, which we didn't do in class, you don't have to do in the general case, the algorithm comes up with a set of weights. So it tells you how important this set of repetitions is versus these pairs. And that, that's like the, the juicy part of that derivation that we, we skipped here. So think about that. Uh, and also think about this here. What if I change the sign of that T? Does it still work or not? What if I had another T? So there, there's actually a very good algorithm that works with like TT minus T and T. And I've implemented that one before in uh, some over-the-air experiments, and it really works like a lot better. Because this T here, you know, the, the problem with sort of this other approach is that, you know, this correlates with this, this correlates with this, this correlates with this. You end up with... Um, tend to get a very smooth, like you don't get a very sharp peak. You tend to get kind of a blurred peak when you do this frame synchronization. This actually, it turns out, gives you something very sharp because you can subtract this off of this and you actually, you'll actually get a sharper peak. Not obvious, maybe, but if you think about it intuitively, hopefully you can see that. So we went through synchronization and then, now after that, we, we finished everything we did in the lab, and then we started talking about, we, we had two lectures on uh, GSM and 802.11a. These, these are probably be the hardest ones for you to um, synthesize into your little one sheet, or three sheets for the final. But, you know, you have to look at those systems, go back and read through the documents that we talked about here and look at the material that I highlighted because I uploaded on Blackboard what I highlighted and look at that material and uh, try to connect that back to the material we did in the lab because th those are the th things that I, I most want you to realize. You know, it's like why, why is the training structure in a particular way? What's the, um, you know, how is the structure of the training different in 11A and GSM? How is frequency offset different in one and the other? How does that determine, like, kind of the algorithms that you might use in each of them? And how is the, the frame structure different? Why is it different? Why is it different, you know, because of the different applications, LAN versus mobile cellular? So the kinds of questions I typically ask here is not so much, did you remember to write this down, but it's more like um, comparing or contrasting some aspect of these standards. So that's the typical questions I like to ask here. After this, we went into propagation modeling after, um, well, right around midterm number two here. And then there, 
we went through this whole notion of average received signal power, looking at this, um, you know, plot that where signals sort of decaying and, you know, if you zoom in as a function of distance, you find that this is also, you know, fluctuating a lot. And so we characterize this, the small scale fading here. We characterize the large scale fading. And then we did some performance analysis with those two kinds of fading here. And then I, I point you to link budget here. Link budget, I did not do at this time, and I did it in the last lecture. So those of you that um, I haven't seen in a long time, you might uh, go back through the previous lecture to see the discussion of link budget here. So this was large scale fading. Main things here, distant dependent path loss. And you know, go through that equation carefully here, because I think I presented it like three times. Two times I screwed it up. So make sure you got the, the constants correct on there. Uh, and then we talked about small scale fading, coherence regions, coherence time, coherence bandwidth. If, if I have time, I'm going to say a little bit more about this. So I will, I will skip that. Uh, after this, we talked about probability of error in fading channels. Here, the simple model was like this. Y equals H S of N plus noise. And then we computed a sum probability of error given the channel using the bounds that we had before. And then we took the expectation of that with respect to the channel. No, we're talking about the Rayleigh fading channel. And then we went through here, through a series of, you know, another upper bound, turn off upper bound. We ended up with a result that looked like Sorry, this is EX over ah. So for the Rayleigh channel, we got a result like this here, which is not nearly as good as the um, the Q function. The performance is much worse here, and that. If we plot the, the probability of errors in the Q function case, in this case, we see that there's a, a gap depending on the operating probability of error, and that gap is the fade margin. Now, the, we found that, you know, the probability of error, if you have this small-scale fading, is really bad because you, the, even though I'm just kind of drawing a picture here, this gap can be like 15 dB. So 3 dB for every factor of 2. So let's see, how many factors of 2? 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. You know, 2 to the 5, I mean, you need a lot more power to communicate at the same probability of error if you're going to allow the signal to be fluctuating over time. Then we went and talked about this idea of diversity, uh, focusing on receive antenna diversity, selection diversity, maximum ratio combining, probability of error with diversity. And then we looked at transit diversity, so how we could use transmit antennas. In particular, focus on the Alamuti scheme, also talked about transit beam forming. After that, we looked at systems that have multiple transmit and multiple receive antennas. The basic MIMO communication concept, and there we've got this uh, y equals you know hx or hs sorry plus v kind of concept. There we looked at the idea of spatial multiplexing. We looked at the 
you know, the optimum detector for this kind of input-output relationship. We looked at the zero-forcing detector. Then we talked about this generalization to OFDM as well as channel estimation. So basically what we did in, in these lectures right here, let's see, we didn't end up talking about 11N. We also didn't do synchronization. But we did talk about channel estimation. I, I mentioned synchronization briefly, but didn't do too much of it. But the main things were uh, you know, looking at the maximum likelihood detector, the performance of the maximum likelihood detector, and then seeing how to estimate the channel by sending training on different antennas, and then using the um, OFDM concept to simplify equalization. So that was like the main, the main concepts here. With these last few lectures, you know, the, the main reference that you want to use is the um, little bit of material that's in Chapter 5 and then also the lecture notes, because that is like the one topic that I've been expanding the last couple times I taught the class, and I don't have as much material on it in the book yet. But I have put problems in there, and then I've also got just, you know, about five pages of, of background there on those topics here. Okay, and now we're here at the course review. So I have a couple specific topics to address. Um, does anyone have any other questions before I do that? Uh, sorry, in the GSM uh, in the beginning for internet to looking at. Yeah, that's um, it's a good question. The so GSM, the training, the burst structure looks something like this here. There was training in the middle, and then data. There was actually some junk on either side too. And then 802.11a and friends, you have a, uh, you have the, the training like at the beginning, and then you have data here. The, the reasons that I, I think that these are in each of these respective places here is that, first of all, in, in 802.11a, the way the, um, the MAC protocol works, you know, you, you send, so you send a packet, and then um, other receivers may you know, receive that packet, look at it, and be like, oh, that's not for me, so I can ignore the rest of it, you know, as opposed to reading the whole packet, decoding it, and then reading, realizing, oh, that's not for me, I can ignore it later. So that might be one reason that it's there. Uh, th there is some control information that usually goes in there that tells other people when you hear this to not access the channel for a certain amount of time. For the, in, in the GSM case, the reasons that I think it's in the middle, one is the mobility, because it's a mobile system. The distance between this and this is half the distance of the whole block here. And so the, so if you estimate the channel in the middle, you know, it, it can only be off by a little bit here or here. Whereas if you estimate it at the beginning, it can be further changed by the end of the block. That's like the justification that I gave in the class. There's other reasons as well. I mean, you, you may get some, you know, transient effects from the ramp up or ramp down here or some settling effects. There could be other reasons as well to have it in the middle. There's probably more. I mean, it's 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 hard to say without you know kind of going back and being part of those discussions. Could a possible reason be the fact that um, like with 802.11, there's a field that tells you how much data is in the packet, whereas at GSM it's fixed length. Yeah, but that, but I mean, it could still be at the beginning, even if it's fixed length. I mean, it's that's but a I good mean, point. But I mean, whereas 802.11, I don't know if you would necessarily put a training signal in the middle, like after you set the link or something. Well, yeah, I mean, you'd have to decode that yeah. that link, right? So if it was at the end, you would buffer everything, 
then estimate the channel, and then maybe just throw it away. So sort of from a real-time signal processing perspective, it makes sense to decode the length first so you know what to do. You also don't know how long to store it, right? If the training was in the middle, you'd have to wait some amount of time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it would be hard to do that, yeah. So they have the variable length. Yeah, the variable length point, yeah. All right, so any other questions? Yes? Uh, after we finished drawing the block diagram for the ORTF system, I think you had a discussion on uh, the initial block, like the pulse shaping, uh, symbol timing estimation. Like all of them become sort of redundant. Can you repeat that uh, discussion? Yeah. Um, fortunately, I don't have the block diagrams handy. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, I want to redraw them, but the, okay, so one of the questions was, do you need pulse shaping in the transmitter with OFEM? And then another question was, do you need um, match filtering at the receiver? And the, the answer, I was trying to get to that in the 10th homework assignment, or maybe it was the 11th, which is that uh, you don't really need with OFTM, you're really shape, you, you can play other games to shape the spectrum. So you don't really need pulse shaping to shape the spectrum. So a lot of times when people are talking about OFTM, they actually imagine using just rectangular pulse, pulses effectively. And then that um, leads to poor decay in frequency. But then when you use rectangular pulses, you end up with essentially a whole bunch of subcarriers over time. And then if you turn off the edges of the subcarriers, you can kind of reduce that sort of edge effect there. So the, the conclusion is that you don't necessarily need pulse shaping for OFDM. This basically is the conclusion. But exactly why we didn't really do it, because we didn't derive the spectrum without pulse shaping. Uh, what about the symbol uh, timing decode? Symbol timing, also, you don't really need it. I mean, you can have it. Um, it'll work better with it, but it's not absolutely required. Think about it, that it's actually a fair amount of complexity, so you can get rid of that piece. Do you think you operate on the sample space instead of symbol space is, is higher complexity? Like the correlations that you do in the, um, the carrier frequency offset synchronization frame sync, it, it, that probably eats up a lot of the um, performance of your system there, just because it's just raw multiplying numbers and, and adding them. All right, so let me um, go through a couple uh, of your other questions. Um, I see something here about the Schmidl Cox algorithm. So I'm going to just uh, mention a few things. I have too much time. I would try to summarize the, um, the key features of that algorithm here. All right, so the schmidl Cox algorithm. So we have, first of all, that we're using OFDM. So we have our data coming in. We have a cyclic prefix. We have output data. So we've got like our W of N here is our um, inverse DFT of the input symbols over n here. And then you have to remember there's this, this L here is for the cyclic prefix. This is all true for 0 through 
n plus l minus 1 here. Or sorry, l sub c. That should be l sub c there too. All right, so we're using OFDM. And then we're going to pick the S of n here such that the W of n is periodic here. So, so we turn off odd subcarriers. When we turn off odd subcarriers, this leads to W of n being periodic. And what that means is that W of n is equal to W of n plus capital N over 2, where n is equal to L sub c plus 1 through n over 2 minus 1. So that's our periodicity here. Now, the thing to notice here is this, um, this factor right here. So because of that factor, we end up with, um, you know, at our receiver here, something like y of n equals e to the j, 2 pi, epsilon n, sum over l, h of l, w of n minus l, plus v of n, and then in the second phase, we're going to use n over 2, so like y of w of n plus n over 2, is e to the j 2 pi epsilon n over 2, e to the j 2 pi epsilon n, h of l, w of n minus l, plus n over 2, plus v of n plus n over 2, So here, yeah, so this, this was like the, the equation that we had here, just showing that the frequency offset effect is 2 pi epsilon n over 2 here. We have an n there. And then this is true for, I uh, forgot to discard the cyclic prefix, um, but anyways, it's something like that here. And so then using this result, that led us to, so we used the Moose algorithm to find that epsilon hat was equal to the phase of, what was it here, sum over divided by n over 2 should be 2 pi. I think that's correct. I might, I might be screwing up this factor here. So that was, um, let's turn off of the odd subcarriers. And then three is, you know, exploit periodicity. And then four is the integer offset correction. So here we suppose now that we have a second OFDM symbol. So now we've got, you know, let's see here. Um, so basically W of n is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to n all right, n minus 1, s of 2, s of 2m, e to the j, 2 pi, n minus l sub c, m over over 2, so something like this here. And then now we suppose that we have like another set of data here. Let's call it, let's see, w, uh, 
um, I don't remember what notation I used before here. Let's call it Q of N. It's going to be the same as what we had with up there. So it's also periodic, but it's got a different training sequence here. Let's call it T of M here. And then it has this special property here that the, um, the T's here are such that, let's see here, T of N is equal to S of N times some other quantity here. Let's call it, yeah, I'm really screwing up the notation here. Let's see, T1, T1. Yeah, oh, that's fine. All right. S, call it 3T3. So here, what we're saying is that the symbol that's sent here is equal to the symbol S of N times a yet another symbol here. So this is an example of, um, yeah, it's like, yes. Differential. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's differential. But um, just thinking here. Um, Yeah, because everything here is a, it's a phase. Yeah. So this is like, let's say, QPSK type symbols here. This is called, it's a differential encoding here. So this integer offset, this is like the new piece that was in schmidt cox that wasn't in the Moose algorithm. And then the main place that we used this was we said that Okay, because of the structure here, because of this periodic structure, we can correct an epsilon that is, um, you know, an integer multiple here of this n over 2. Because the maximum range we can get is plus, is essentially something within the range of n over 2. So we're going to correct um, an offset modulo n over 2. So what that means is that we're actually going to be left with some other a quantity here that we didn't plan for. So after, after correction, we're left with something like y1 of k, which is equal to e to the j 2 pi L sub c Two m over n. H of this is in the after the OFDM receiver times this is my s here. And then on the second side, you had something like this here: e to the j two pi two l sub c two m over n h k minus 2m mod n. And then here I've got t3 k minus 2m mod n here. Two of k here. And then the point here was to use this um, differential encoding idea. So because these guys here are qpsk, we multiply through by t2 star let's say S of N here, ah, sorry, S of N conjugate times T3 of N is equal to T2 of N because of the differential encoding. And then over here, if we multiply through Y2 of K by Y1 of K, then that equals E to J 2 pi 2 L sub C M over N 
h of 2, h of, sorry, k minus 2 m n t 3 of k minus 2 m n times s star k minus 2 m times n plus other terms here. And then that becomes t 2 of n, t 2 of k, And then using that, we built up a least squares type estimator to estimate this unknown n here. So that was essentially the idea. So the key points here, we use OFDM, we turn off the odd subcarriers, we exploit periodicity, we have an integer offset, we correct for that integer, we correct for the residual offset, and then we try to figure out the, the shift um, due to the integer offset, and then we estimate that with a special um, pre-coding here. Uh, I'm just realizing that I've gone like 10 minutes over here. Um, I guess I will stop here. I had a couple other things to mention, uh, but I will stop here, and I'll be in my office uh, now for a little while if anyone else has any other questions here. So that is it. So I'll see you all on the 16th in the morning.